So, hello and good morning, guys, um, and good evening as well. Welcome to the Improvement Season podcast with me, Pascal Flor, out of Berlin, Germany. And on the other end, it is Steve, who's sitting in uh, Timbuktu, or on Timbuktu, and is actually enjoying pina coladas on the beach. Ahoy, I'm on a boat. <laughs> yeah, I'm on a boat, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm on a boat, mother... Yeah. Ahoy, ahoy. And then it yeah. was... What's the morning one uh moin moin moin, moin. moin yeah moin. um so just as a short background story for you guys steve and i already recorded a short section and then i um realized that i didn't press the record button on my end so um we talked a little bit about dialects and that was it basically but um, as you guys know i ramble a lot and that's why it was already five minutes or so and commas and full stops and the confusion oh, yeah, and between <laughs> Germans <laughs> and English. That's true. That's true. But so, um, yeah, that wasn't really that important anyway. I would have cut that out anyway. So, oh. um, yeah, let's start straight into how your last week has been. So my last week, yeah, I was saying it's basically been a theme of consuming more food and being a little bit frustrated training is going really really well so just so i can make it very clear that i'm not like chasing scale weight as such mm. but i'd been stuck at around like 193 194 for like i don't know it hadn't quite been a month but it had been a few weeks and so i just i was gaining consistently on 3800 calories pretty much so I'd, i was like come on like three nine four thousand nothing nothing so i've been eating four thousand two hundred for like the last four days and i've hit two heavy weigh-ins this week where i was over 195 pounds so i'm the officially oh. the heaviest i've ever been in my life which is really weird to say actually um but yeah so how does it feel for you i mean you <laughs> still have apps showing so it's true. <laughs> i would assume that it's not that bad I'm actually really pleased with my body composition at this body weight. Like I still look reasonable, which is cool. Um, I think oh. I do hold fat favorably. So obviously a lot of it's on my booty and uh, on the thighs, but not crazy amounts. Like I can still, if I contract my quad, I can see like a, a something there. Like there's a muscle that moves <laughs> just about and uh, with my glutes and stuff. I think there's, I don't know, there's just a lot of coverage there. But yeah, upper body, oh. I mean, my upper body probably looks like 5% leaner than my lower body. <laughs> Are you already out of breath when you're walking stairs? I've, You know what? People talk about that and I've never really experienced it. I don't know if no? I just don't walk up steep enough stairs or enough of them. Um, if I was to walk up to the top of my flat, to my flat, nine flights, I probably would get out of breath if I went at a decent pace. But yeah, I don't so, feel physically unfit or unwell. Like, I yeah. feel good. That That's a really good indicator, actually, to push in further. Yeah. I mean, um, I think many people, and myself included, sometimes push it too long and too hard. And then they come to a point where it's just, like, detrimental already. Not just in regards to your overall performance and the way you feel and the way you look, but also just in, for your overall health. Because... Yes, we don't need the, the BMI and all that kind of stuff is a little bit um, screwed, but it's still a good indicator for overall health. And especially when we take a look at mortality risk, the higher the BMI, uh, the higher the BMI, the worse your um, health output or outcomes get, actually. And that is independent of your body composition. I mean, people who are IFBB pros, they carry a lot of muscle mass, right? But when their body mass index is above 30 as well... It's still a health risk, yeah. Yeah, it is. Because the, the heart has to do much, much more. And this is why, like, I don't know, tall, very tall people just don't live as long. Like, yeah. people who are very, very tall. So I'm very happy with my average 5'10 height for that reason. <laughs> um, and then, no. again, that's one... I think that might be... I'm not completely convinced of, or sure I know this but I think that it well I know it's one of the biggest risks with taking anabolic steroids is you just become a bigger person and yeah. so it's a big health risk um no, absolutely so yeah for me I'm not going to be that big but I hope to get close to that 200 pound mark oh, I'll yeah. see how things go over the next few weeks I'm in my third just started the third week of this mesocycle I will be going for five uh, because I just I can just see that happening um, and then it's a case of deciding where I want to go after that. I have a few options in mind. Um, 
And I know into the summer or <laughs> over the summer with 200 pounds. Then cool. I, 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 I can already promise you that like then <laughs> going up the stairs will become a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what was I going to say? Yeah, I, I have a few options and it's, I know we talked before about considering like looking at 2020, do I want to compete and kind of going back from there? I don't know if that's right now in my head, competing is not at the, it's not at the forefront of my mind. I'm quite happy not to compete for quite a few years and I'd prefer to keep capitalizing on growing the business, growing my social life, growing in the gym. Um, and I don't feel the need to compete, to be honest. Uh, and I don't want to until I'm really satisfied that I am going to look very different because I have to look very different to be comp as competitive as I want to be. Oh. And I keep getting so much positive reinforcement for looking bigger. <laughs> so it's kind mm. of like, I don't want to look small. <laughs> no. Yeah. And I bought I mean, all these new clothes now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the biggest problem. Um, no, but I think that this is always a thing. So many people, and also once again, myself included, have uh, that when you step on stage or you, you are um, looking for that, not being big enough is a big concern for many people. And myself included, mm. once again. I mean, um, I'm looking at myself and it's just like, <laughs> come on. Right. And you, but this is, I think, just a byproduct of being a bodybuilder. Yeah. Just a kind of a body dysmorphia thing going on. And no matter how you look, you will always, um, there, there's this me, uh, the, this one single meme where that one, um, stick figure is standing in front of a yeah. mirror or so, but he's actually quite muscular. But in the mirror, in his uh, mirror reflection, he looks like a stick figure. Yeah. Um, I think that, it becomes more and more clear that people, there's a different kind of anorexia out there. And that is being a bodybuilder or so, right? Um, that so many people have a screwed image of themselves when it comes to that. And the more invested they get, the more uh, or the, the higher the goals get and ambitions get when it comes to bodybuilding, the more severe it actually gets for some people. Mm -hmm. No, I completely agree. It's It's kind of scary that, but fortunately for me, I have my mindset's just got better and better in terms of just looking mm -hmm. at myself in the mirror and being way more focused on performance outcomes, which is really nice. Um, but yeah, it's, I just, yeah, I, I think what will end up happening for me, I almost view it like this is there'll become a time and it won't be that far off where I need to do a bit longer of a cut where a mini cut just won't hack it. I'll need to do like 10 weeks of dieting. And then at the end of that, I'll be like, now, do I want to maintain and then dig for shows or do I want to maintain and get back to building? And I think that mm. will be really telling like when I'm, I don't know, like 15, 20 pounds above stage weight and I can really have a realistic view of how will I look on stage? Am I ready to go against some of those big dogs who outmassed me? Um, mm. So, yeah. And it will depend on what happens in my life. Like you've had that kind of spanner in the works with the child. Yeah. Me and Charlotte will probably be moving out next year into a what? into a house um, seriously yeah that will probably be happening i want to do it because i'm f you didn't actually tell me about that well we can, yeah plans it's charlotte kind of likes renting she's been renting for flipping ages but Why? I, I, I exactly i i hate spending all the money on rent made um, as is so uh because katie and i are considering that as well and this is going to happen in the next two years because we are seriously planning that because it's so stupid that you are paying for the rest of your life rent or money to someone else and you don't and you end up with nothing in your hands rather take that money on a month-to-month -month basis and invest it into your own house and after 30 or 40 years you have actually paid for the entire house yeah and then we can get garage gyms <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. I move out. <laughs> no, so I'm not looking for a garage. I'm looking for a basement. Yeah, basement would be better. So uh, the basement. So this would be the gym and also my working room. So nice. two separate, two separate rooms, of course. So not that there's any kind of barbells sitting right in, uh, next to me when I'm doing my check-ins. But um, yeah, this is this is a plan for us. So no base, uh, no car. No, what was it? What did you say oh, that garage. you want to? Uh, no garage gym for me, but more so, yeah, basement, basement gym. Oh, that'd be so good. And yeah, the totally. great thing, like I'd be really excited to be able to do really good video footage because that's something mm. that's really hard to do in a commercial gym. Yeah, getting some like, and then check-ins. Uh, I, I mean, 
the amount of times I've done like weird stuff in my room, yeah. house to try and show how to do a movement. Whereas actually you could yeah. pick up a barbell and do it oh, there. Right, That'd yeah. be so cool. No, absolutely. So yeah, I guess, what was I saying for my week? That's been the highlight. Um, I had a few social things which were pretty cool over the weekend. I uh, met up with some old friends that I hadn't seen in ages. It had been far too long. I think it had been- Friends. <laughs> friends. Um, we're arranging it again, actually. It went well. So um, they, they won't be listening to this, but I hadn't seen them in over four years. And these were people who I was like best friends with at uh, in sick form. So like 16, 17 years old. And it's funny because no one's changed. We're all the same. <laughs> We're all the same sort of people. Yeah. So we still got on well. So that was nice because I have such a small social network and I kind of want some more friends that are like us and lift and stuff. But it's so hard <laughs> to, like, there's no one around me no. that does this. No. So, yeah, that was cool. How yeah, about, how's um, your week going? So, so I have uh, two things on that one. Um, first and foremost, the question I have is when other people around you can't see your friends, are they truly your friends? When they can't see your friends, what do you mean? Imaginary friends. Oh. <laughs> Imaginary friends. Um, so I'm here with my friends. Oh, which friends? Okay. Uh, no, uh, in all seriousness, the I find it cool that you went actually out and did something there because we've discussed this so often that you can easily fall into the habit of just doing your thing. And especially as a online person, a trainer, mm -hmm. when you're just sitting in front of a computer, you have the perception as if you're speaking regularly with people outside of your home, but it's not really. It's just the, the check-ins, right? Um, and then going out every once in a while, I think it's just a good thing to do, to be honest. Yeah, it's, that's actually crazy. I want like, because I get, we get tons of social interaction. I mean, we both talk to like 30 mm -hmm. plus people, different people every week who are just our yeah. clients. And then we talk to each other a lot. We talk on, well, I talk on Instagram to people um, and we, I talk to people on the podcast and we obviously talk every week. So it feels like there's a lot of social interaction, but it's not in person. And it is, it's definitely different in person. Uh, but I'm so grateful yeah. for the internet for connecting me to be, I mean, like I, uh, I don't know if it'll be out yet, but ask the athlete, be excited for this. And I spoke to oh, Brett yeah. Freeman about, uh, well, I spoke to Brett Freeman, who I've talked to over online a tiny bit. Um, mm. It was just really nice just to chat to him, but I'd love it if these people were closer and you could actually be like, do you want to oh. get a coffee? <laughs> Mate, uh, and that is it, the time. you Once again, time is limited, and especially in that case, if you have time on your side on uh, those occasions, you can actually really just have a flowing conversation where it's also not just like, oh, I need to stop because I have to go on to the next client and stuff like that. But you can actually yeah. really get to know the other person. Um, and yeah, that's why I love actually then going out every once in a while. And, and okay, now at that age, it's more so meeting with old friends and just catching up instead of, yeah, I don't know, um, meeting new people yeah. all the time. Yeah. So yeah, that's all that happened in my week. Um, and actually, you just remind me, it's why I really embrace client meetups and i'm always so grateful when clients come to those because you actually get to properly get to know that person when you see yeah. them face to face so yeah that apart from that um everything's going pretty swimmingly um i'm not doing deadlifts as people know so they're not battering me anymore uh which i don't know if i've i've just noticed i think systemically i'm there's no days where i'm just like effed i just generally mm. feel better um I don't know if that will lead to better performance outcomes with my squats and maybe some of my pulling I expect maybe will be better. Um, but yeah, it's all going smoothly. Romania deadlifts cool. obviously are performing better because I'm not deadlifting, but that's a given. Uh, so how's no, cool. your week gone? Fat loss? Has the scale come down yet? Oh, We're still it's waiting. weird. Yeah, it's weird because I'm definitely getting leaner. I can tell that uh, due to my inser belt. Um, it's a lever belt, so it, it won't change in the size and diameter when you put it on. Um, but I can definitely tell that I'm getting leaner and also, yeah, just from a visual perspective. But it's not really showing up on the scale. Um, so over the past days, I always woke up a little bit earlier because Hugo is sick. So um, Katie went to battle with Hugo and because of uh, the pregnancy um, sickness as well, kind of. Um, 
she's always going to bed with him and falling asleep at the same time so i have plenty of time at the end of the day for myself so i'm playing a little bit with myself um in terms of my body right because i don't have any kind of sexual intercourse with katie anymore because she's pregnant um <laughs> no i'm just kidding <laughs> what's that um, i was gonna say too where, much where, information where, where's it going to uh no TMI. so i pl- <laughs> I, I I have plenty of time at the end of the day. So because I'm then used to normally to spend the evening together with Katie, um, just relaxing a little bit, I'm just like, okay, what what should I do now? Okay, I'm just laying down in my bed and I'm reading something. But then at nine, I'm already falling asleep. But because of these this small change in the schedule, I'm always already waking up a little bit earlier than my alarm. So one hour earlier weigh-ins i don't know if that Mm. has such a huge impact but it's definitely a change that possibly could mask a little bit the fat loss on the scale but yeah i'm I'm just sticking with that for now because there's no way that i'm not losing weight on the macros i'm taking in right now because these are the macros i've been running in the summertime and the summertime i was losing at a really rapid pace um and nothing else has changed i'm uh, okay i'm only doing 10k steps and not 12k steps but this is definitely not the reason why i'm not seeing the the change on the scale weight um otherwise Nothing has changed in regards to my activity levels. I'm still doing um, the, the warm up as a form of my cardio. Um, so I, I don't know if we ever talked about it, but this is something I've started implementing with a lot of my clients and with myself because it's so much more convenient. So um, spreading the cardio out on all your training days and doing it as a warm up and maybe also as a cool down. So um, then let's say I'm training now five days a week. I'm doing five times 100k cuts. That's it, right? And this seems so easier and much more convenient because I don't have to take another day out of my week to then go to the gym and do my cardio, but I'm just doing it like, okay, I'm doing it as a warm up or as a, um, a cool down. If it requires too much energy and time already before the workout um so for some clients i'm doing it like yeah 10 times something like 100k calls or so and it's so much better i've uh, um i came to realize because it's so much easier also to recover from because when you're doing even if it's just this um sometimes it's mentally straining to get your ass up on a rest day, go to the gym and maybe spend like seven days out of a week in the gym. Some people simply don't want it, especially when it's a long commute. And this just allows for getting your cardio and getting a little bit more energy expenditure without it feeling like you're doing cardio. And this is what I'm doing and this is what I have done in in the summertime as well. So, and other than that, I'm doing my walks I'm sitting at home, so nothing really changed in comparison to what I've done in the summertime and not even things that are um, that I'm not tracking because I'm kind of aware of every single variation uh, variable I, I have right now going on. And there aren't really too many, to be honest. So, yeah, in a nutshell, I'm trusting the process. I'm not stressing out about it. I would if that would be a client i would probably start to consider making a change give it another week maybe and then uh, if the scare rate still doesn't move probably make some changes just to be on the safe side yeah it's really interesting because um that obviously happened to me during my effectively yeah. it's exactly the same time point at which it's happened where did the diet before the diet maintained and then it's ha- it happened that first mesocycle um, within the cut and just no scale change and so actually it's funny because it's happened with you and it's also uh, happening with my client josh who he's very lean like he's uh, about six weeks out now but his scale weight if anything actually i think it's come up slightly from when he was maintaining to now dieting mm-hmm. and it's like well, obviously he I mean his physique you can see it, it's got leaner he knows he's got leaner but the scale's just not budging so we basically maintained well yeah maintained the deficit that entire time didn't make any changes and I'm hoping, and if this doesn't quite work out, I mean, it's going to be frustrating, but we're taking a deload diet break. And I'm thinking after that diet break, there's just going to be this massive whoosh, which is kind of what happened with me, where I just saw a whoosh after the diet break and then kind of digging it again. So maybe, I don't know if you're planning to have a diet break when you're deloading in like a couple of weeks, potentially that's when it will kind of 
Yeah, Come so on. the plan is because I'm feeling so good, so good. Um, I'm definitely doing a fifth week of this mesocycle, so I'm extending it by another week. Um, and then after, so we will be in Birmingham for our Ultimate Coach Seminar. Um, on the weekend of the 9th of February and this following week also because of traveling and I've I've seen in the past whenever I traveled to London and stuff like that and came back that I was shattered yeah and in the past I always did it like that I had my deload before traveling and then I'm going into the week one and this time around it's perfect timing that I actually I am able to extend the mesocycle take the deload after the traveling um, i'm probably not going to do a diet break on that first deload maybe so what i'm considering is doing like three days or four days of refeed and then getting back into the deficit but the first um, diet break is first plan on the second deload to come mm -hmm. cool yeah it'll be yeah i know i remember every time we talk on here the, the kind of days after it's like yeah traveling just yeah. shatters you although dieting yeah. whilst you're traveling is relatively easy although i don't know what we have planned food wise i think it was sushi or something <laughs> was it in the uk oh man i'm from berlin everything is super cheap uh, relatively cheap here and when i have sushi in the uk i don't know if i'm if i'm i think birmingham, all of my money. birmingham might be a little bit less expensive than london at least but i don't know yeah. maybe there's a good pizza place <laughs> <laughs> yeah or a subway or a subway <laughs> um so yeah that's our weeks i don't think there's anything more to really go over something actually i just no. want to bring up really quickly because it's something that i was reacquainted with recently in that um one of my friends who i met up with on the weekend was kind of talking to me about this sleep app that he's been kind of utilizing where it wakes him up in his light sleep cycle to wait for that and then i was listening to an audiobook recently and I think the listeners are probably going to want to know what it's called. So let me get that up, which I don't recommend highly. I recommend more so highly why we sleep because this is a little mm. bit, he's not like a sleep researcher. It's a little bit more, for lack of a better term, bro science-y. So it's Sleep Smarter, 21 Essential Tips or something by Sean Stevenson, who mm -hmm. apparently is actually like a big Instagram fitness person or something. But anyway, mm -hmm. one of the things he was talking about in there was like sleep cycles and how kind of you can pick either going for like five sleep cycles or six sleep cycles, but basically you don't want to wake up from a sleep cycle, then try and go to sleep and then wake up in the middle of a sleep cycle. And sleep cycles are like 90 minutes or something, but yours can vary depending on who you are. But anyway, this morning I woke up just before my alarm and then I was going to go to sleep. And then I was like, but I feel really good now. And you, lately I've been going back to sleep and then waking up to my alarm and I've been mm -hmm. feeling like shit. And so I didn't yeah. do it this morning. I was like, actually, I feel so much better. So I think there is actually something to waking up in your light sleep cycle rather than like going, basically you want to get through a whole cycle before yeah. um, waking up again. So it was just interesting because I think a lot of people think about, oh, I'm awake, but should I get that extra like, don't know, 60 minutes of sleep or like half an hour of sleep? It's like, well, if you're going to interrupt a sleep cycle, potentially not, potentially just get up now and you'll feel better for it. Mate, I loved it when I was still living in uh, by myself or with my roomie, but Katie and I wasn't together. I weren't together, and I was just not having that much on my schedule anymore because I was still already finishing uh, evening school, so I wasn't really forced to actually go there as well. So um, I had plenty of time, also then just to sleep. Uh, sleep as long as I wanted and I always slept like nine to ten hours so and was waking yeah I was waking up just naturally and never in my life have I felt such good performance in the gym never it makes a big difference yeah so listeners nine to ten hours that's what you need <laughs> at least that was uh, the perfect time for me um yeah I don't know I, I was always, so productive in that time I think I could probably get up later and get more sleep but it's always one of those like i don't know i think i get ample i think i get like i think my sleep's pretty good but i probably could i wonder if like yeah add that hour in do you need that hour in the day could you perform better if you had that extra hour right. so like, i think if you're getting over like seven i think i mean i wouldn't stress too much about getting more yeah i mean right now it's simply not um in, in it for me to get more sleep Something not possible with Hugo and Katie around, with the duties and tasks I need to do on a day-to-day -day basis, and also with um, the the 
um, the traffic and stuff. So certainly not in it for me right now to do it, but maybe in the future when I have my um, basement gym. It's true. And then there's always the case of more, like anything, more isn't better. So if you feel yeah. wakeful, and actually, I don't know if it's just been, I, I haven't really thought about this recently, but I generally, through the days, there's not a period of time in the day where I'm like feeling super exhausted and I need a coffee to pick me up, which is a good sign. Um, mm. I think if you're feeling like that, I wouldn't say it's necessarily bad, but then you could say, yeah, you probably could do it more sleep. Oh. And Pascal's you want so, now. So, so. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> Should oh we get gosh. into the questions? Yeah. Let's Enough do that. Adding from us. So, Giovanna Patafio. I would just assume that it's that way it's pronounced. Um, Patafio. Giovanna Patafio. That's the way. If you are going from MEV to MRV, at some point your fatigue will accumulate and performance will drop. However, if you were to lower the weight, but it it's still being above 60% one, or, uh, one rep max, you could probably do more volume, i.e. sets per session a week. Is this a way to get around reaching your MRV? If the weight is above 60% one rep max, it is not considered junk volume. What do you think of this? Where you could do more volume if you just lower the weight and still could accumulate more volume? Thanks so much. Love the podcast. Hey, from New York. Um, so thank you very much. So what he's asking, Steve, is basically dropping the uh, load on the bar to accumulate more volume. Um, and then everything above 60% of one rep max is still productive and not junk volume. Mm-hmm. That's how I yeah, yeah. Um, interpreted it. That's how I interpreted it as well. I'm just trying to think it through my head and the way you'd actually apply that. So I don't know if it's like you got to your week before you're deloading and then you're like, instead of deloading, I'm going to just reduce all my loads by, I don't know, 10%, assuming that's still above 60%. And then you perform, but your performance is pretty subpar in my head I'm thinking it through and I'm just thinking eventually even if you are able to eke out another week I don't necessarily think that week of training is going to be superlative or particularly productive or very overloading and I think you're I mean when you hit MRV you're still going to hit it eventually and you're still going to see a performance drop so I imagine your performance with that 60% if you are going near to 60% of your one rep max is lower than what you would expect and therefore isn't going to be particularly beneficial i don't know i don't know if i've misinterpreted not misinterpreted if i've really thought it through enough i'd have to really think it through heavily i don't know if you've got any more Mm. thoughts i might need to think about it a bit more (laughs) yeah i mean my initial thoughts are as followed and that is um when it comes to the threshold of 60 percent, there's probably nothing magical about 60 percent or so it could possibly be lower that it's still i mean we've seen evidence of it 40 percent and above that it, this is causing the same amount of hypertrophy if you are having the same amount of relative uh, output when it comes to that um so i think the biggest problem you're probably running into is time so time is always the biggest question for every trainee because if we had limit unlimited time we could spend as much time in the gym as we would, right? Like three, four, five hours, right? And taking plenty of rest in between so that we are able to accumulate as much volume as possible. Where the seeding is of seeing then diminishing returns is really up to debate. And I think there's, I mean, especially with this study from James Craig or Brett Schoenfeld, um, we have seen that so far we don't know where this seeding is and it might look quite different for many, many individuals. So that being said, I think that let's leave time off the table because this is always, it is always the same for every individual, right? Some people have more time available than others. But let's just say um, you are average when it comes to the time investment you are able to put into the gym. Um, I think at some point, um, you could then also make the argument of the what I found really, really uh, insightful was from Chris Beardsley, the recent video of him with the central nervous system and the peripheral uh, n- uh, nervous system of when the central nervous system gets fatigued, the peripheral nervous system is, of course, impacted. That's obvious. Uh, but 
by that the motor unit recruitment isn't as high anymore and because of that your output and the the time you're spending with doing consecutive sets or reps is not as high in quality anymore because you can't recruit all of your motor units anymore thus you're probably not getting as much hypertrophy out of it um, and you could make the case or the argument that this is already kind of junk volume because you are not getting the most out of the sets you're doing instead of just leaving calling it a day and maybe get in when you're again fresh freshly recovered when the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system is ready to fire with all of the motor units you have ready to fire again so i don't know steve whether you have something to add to that one yeah that was interesting and i think that was a good um like interpretation of it as well and it's it's just a it's kind of assuming i don't think we can assume that anything above 60 percent of your one rep max because it recruits all i think it's because it recruits all of the muscle fiber types because it's a certain amount of load so it's heavy enough although actually i think it's heavier than that that you'd need i don't know it's just a case of i think your time element there was really well put and i also think that the best volume to train at for muscle growth is MAV. So we want to be spending as much time there. So I don't know if by extending to this point at which I don't know where you're training and I worry that it would be in that middle ground of junk volume where it wouldn't, it would be fatiguing, but it wouldn't be particularly overloading. It wouldn't be particularly productive. I think you're probably better off kind of deloading, refreshing and spending more time within MAV than trying to edge out some more kind of training. And I imagine just, I've never done it before, but I imagine going through that week my performance wouldn't be very good. I'd be using like light, basically pretty light weights, not getting very many reps. I'd have to be spending ages in the gym to try and get out any amount of volume. I doubt my pumps would be very good. I doubt I'd get very good my muscle connection. You're still going to be producing fatigue. I think it, it, I think it would become junk volume if you tried to do effectively an overreaching week, then reduce loads and then keep training kind of hard through that next week with lots of volume. I just, I think you wouldn't be able to do it. I don't think you'll be productive. Um, and potentially if you could, then you hadn't hit your MRV yet. Yeah, and just to add something there, because it just sprung to my mind. Um, let's just theoretically, once again, bring up the time thing that you have unlimited time. When is the, or where is the ceiling for you where you are deciding to actually take a deload and do the next mesocycle? Because this, what you're saying that um, at some point fatigue will accumulate and performance will drop. Yes, but if you continue with that cycle of dropping the weight so that you are able to do more volume, you could probably keep doing that for a really long time a really long time before you are first and foremost can detect whether the performance is going down because you are lowering the weights every single time and doing more more sets is probably easier um, in the long run than um, increasing the weight on the bar or having that as a metric um, so where's the ceiling now do you want to do like 12 weeks of a mesocycle then I think you could always then make the argument okay have you trained hard enough all right, because this is just a, a legit question you always have to ask yourself. And this is something you, everything above like six weeks, sometimes for females, that's still like uh, appropriate, but everything above six weeks of a mesocycle length for, especially for males, I think then you're starting too low or you're not pushing hard enough or fast enough. Right, so um, I think you will probably get more out of it when you're focusing on a strict setup throughout the mesocycle, adjust here and there, of course, um, but not dropping the weight for the sake of adding sets to the to the to the exercises to extend the mesocycle like forever, basically. Mm. I think there'd be a point at which you're now at a load that is no low, no longer overloading and there is something to increasing load on the bar um, in small amounts i just think you'd hit a wall you just end up hitting a wall over a number of weeks no. where you hit your mrv and even at that lightweight you can do you, you're just fucked <laughs> you can't go because yeah. i know you're the same as me pascal when we go into like our deload weeks it's like everything is like absurd like why is it this difficult it shouldn't be this difficult you're like i didn't oh. i don't even feel that bad but then your performance is just nowhere near where you normally think it is you can feel it systemically you find it hard to keep upright in a squat keeping your back tight in like a deadlift and things i think if the guy was to try it i think he'd end up 
potentially not seeing the results that you'd want to from it. <laughs> I, th- I think so too, but I think that um, the problem is just the, the length of the mesocycle then in it for itself, because it's like you said, you're dropping the weight. Sure, it will still provide some stimulus if we think about that volume is probably the key driver once a minimum threshold of intensity is ensured. You can probably keep that up for a really long time when you're always each and every single session dropping the load for adding one set or so. I think you could go on for a really, really long time. But I think it's simply not a realistic approach because at some point you will be just doing like 12 sets or a single exercise. And at that point, I think it is junk volume. Um, and yeah, I think it's simply not realistic and feasible. Yeah, the pra- it doesn't sound particularly practical. So yeah, I think it was, it was a difficult question to ask. It was interesting though, but... Yeah, it was really interesting and it really made me think and um, rethink whether I'm, I'm missing maybe something or not. Um, but yeah, let's move on to oh, another one. Mag Mo- Monacino. <laughs> I'm so racist with doing that hand gesture. This is my client, Mark. Yeah, I know. I think he might have some Italian roots. Yeah, we had now Giovanna Patafio. No, Giovanna Patafio. Like that. And then Mark Monacino. Um, Amazing. Amazing. Um, So, hey, Steve and Pascal. Back with a second question since you gave a superb reply to the first one. How do you decide when it's time to have the talk with a client about lack of compliance, if their adherence issues are seriously putting their goals at risk, or do you prefer to approach it more gradually? For example, trying to give the client as early notice as possible that something has the potential to derail their progress rather than suddenly coming down with an iron fist during a check-in and reply and saying, you need to change X behavior or won't reach success. Thanks. Mark, it's because he's been fucking up, man. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, he hasn't. Mark, been. Man, no, man. <laughs> Mark is very um, obedient. He's a good client. <laughs> <laughs> obedient, <laughs> even. God, what are you guys up to? Um, so I have some thoughts. If I can go first, is that all right? Yeah, yeah go ahead. So mate. I think we've done a really good job um, because we have our handbook in which we have our coach and client expectations. So we have a load of list of kind of client expectations, what we expect of them. So honesty, adherence as best they can, um, checking in on time, all of these sort of things. So before we even start together, they've seen this. And then we have coaching expectations. So again, that we are kind of in their best interest. We're trying to help them as best as we can. We're on time, um, all of these sort of things. So that really helps us from the outset. And if someone was to be a little bit off, I would probably refer to that initially and just be like remember kind of i need honesty from you and um if you aren't going to be kind of adherent to what we're trying to do then like there's not much point i'd probably have a bit of a softer approach initially if they weren't being adherent and then if it was maybe it was a consistent like week to week there was a lack of adherence i would be like so what's going on do we need to change our approach i'm very much on the assumption that As a coach, you should be meeting your client where they're at. So potentially you've set them up with something that isn't something they can adhere to. And that isn't their fault. You need to kind of come to a middle ground. But there will become a time where you're using potentially the softest approach you possibly can um, to get them to their result that they need to do. Um, And if it was maybe someone in contest prep, this might be not very soft at all. It might be quite strict. And I would basically say if there was one week where they screwed up, if they did it again for another week, I'd give them the chance in that week. If they did it again for another week, I would have the, the kind of iron fist slash the serious talk where I would say, this is contest prep. This is a serious period of time. You have some goals that you need to achieve. I'm your coach. I need to put my best effort forward to get you there. I need you to adhere to this. If there's problems that you're seeing, um, adhering to it, we can discuss that. Uh, if it's just a, you haven't got a good enough why, you need to have a think about that but I need you to adhere to these basic things. And if you can't do that for me, I'm worried that we won't get to the goal. And I know you won't want to step on stage when you're not in your best condition. I won't want to put you on stage in your, not your best condition. So have a serious think about it. And then, so that's one, that second week is where I'd have the serious chat. And then in the third week, I'd hope that they were then more so adherent. They're making steps forward. If they weren't making steps forward, then I would be kind of very blunt with them and be like, 
you, do you seriously want coaching? You're paying for a service here. You've got a goal in mind. Do you even want that goal? Really have an assessment of what is their true desires? What are their priorities? Um, but like I said, at the start, it's very much meeting them where they're at. They may be not adhering because it's something that they cannot adhere to. Um, find a softer approach, um, but you can only go so soft. And in contest prep times, that's when kind of the, the iron fist comes out more so. I think I kind of summarized what I think there. That was very well put, mate. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've nothing more to say um, except for one thing, and that is kind of an example. I just recently had it where I, in the first check-in, I actually did the talk. Oh, yeah. Because, um, yeah, um, nothing, nothing was on. Well, no, I wouldn't say nothing, but uh, a lot of things weren't really as instructed, and um, I then just had to immediately, like, put the cards on the table and be like Steve and say like, okay, why, why do you want to be coached if you are not even following uh, any of the instructions in week one? N why? I I'm confused here, right? And this is not being um, harsh or rude or anything, but you as a coach, and this is, well, I could be in the minority and actually uh, seeing it that way, but you have an obligation of trying the best of your abilities to help the clients to their best outcomes and sometimes that means telling them what they need to hear and that not what they want to hear and if that implies that you are having the talk earlier than you would like then do it go ahead um, still you don't have to so just from a coaching perspective Yes, you want to help people, but not for, uh, at all costs. You still want to be in, uh, in the realms of your principles and you still want to be comfortable in the things you're comfortable with. Um, if there's anything that simply doesn't work for you, okay, have a think about it. Maybe even for myself. Sometimes I'm overreacting um, and I have to calm myself down first and foremost and really try to look at all the opportunities and all the reasons why something went the way it was, right? Most of the time also when people um, are not adherent or there isn't really a con uh, consistency going on, then I'm trying to make it work for them. Where I'm just like saying, okay, hey, mate, there are so many ways that lead to Rome. We don't have to do it that way, especially when it comes to nutrition and stuff like that, right? Um, and also programming stuff. We need to just tick the fundamental boxes and everything else is kind of secondary and we can actually be quite flexible with other things. I, um, I'm always trying to make it happen and work for, for the clients. However, some scenarios it's simply not working and then you really have to put once again the the cards on the table because you're doing yourself a disservice but also the client a disservice in not being honest or fully transparent sometimes some people just <laughs> need a slap in the face and say like okay hey mate i'm not being rude here and i'm not mad or anything but this isn't how it works and this is even something that jeff Alvarez once said to me and the coaching experience where it was just like i don't even remember what it was so it it wasn't that bad otherwise it would still stick with me up until that day but there was one thing where it was just like saying pascal this is non-negotiable we don't need to talk about it if i'm coaching you this is something you have to do cool and i was absolutely fine with that yeah. because this is what i was yeah. signing up for exactly um, I should have been aware of that before I'm deciding to go with that coach. And um, yeah, if you if you can't then, I don't know, take the, the backfire or so, then maybe you are not made for being coached. Yeah, so it's completely true. It does. It's yes, coaching is very much like there's a lot of responsibility on the coach's side, but there's, like we said, there's expectations on the client side as well. You can't get results without the client being adherent somewhat to what you're doing. I've yeah. only ever had it once where I've been, and it was fairly recently, um, where I had to very much say like, I'm not comfortable moving forward if you're going to consistently do what you're doing. Um, I'm not happy taking your money because we're not getting anywhere. And I was like, if we, next week, if we don't see steps forward in the right direction, I'm canceling and like, I wish you all the best and you know I want the best for you, but I'm not happy taking your money. 
And sometimes a threat. But this is then like the that. best for the client. Yeah. So he, then there were steps in the right direction and I'm really happy. So sometimes you just need, they need that kick up the arse almost. Yeah. And they're spending money. Like I don't want to take someone's money who's not really committed. Yeah. Fuck, we don't want your money. No, <laughs> I want all of it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, moving on to the next question. This is why I had a little bit of a smile on my face because this is something you wanted to talk about, um, like I think one or two weeks ago, oh. and we didn't really touch on it. And that's why I'm really, really looking forward for that question oh, coming from one of my clients, Kian. So shout out to Kian and thank you very much for that question. So what are your thoughts on Brett Contreras' recent Instagram post from oh. January? 11th in which he argues that gradually recomping is better than going through cutting and bulking phases do the benefits of a moderate approach outweigh those of a more extreme approach would you say he is targeting the general population with this post as opposed to a competitive bodybuilder that is a good question and i'm surprised go ahead mate yeah i mean we discussed this off air i've kind of had some posts kind of somewhat targeted this in I've kind of talked about recomping. I've recently posted about the methodical mass. Um, my biggest complaint uh, with recomping is I don't believe it doesn't happen. Like the scientific literature shows you can use your own stored body fat and utilize that to build lean tissue. You can recomp, but the scientific literature also shows how difficult that can be for certain populations. And everyone I work with, it's pretty much a no go. Um, and pretty much everyone listens to this podcast. Again, it's not a no-go as such, but more so it's just so slow, so undependable, um, so, so inefficient for anyone who's been lifting for a number of years to be able to do it. And so I just don't like it for that, for those reasons. When you are coaching someone, they're coming for you, to you for results in somewhat of a kind of like not years, it's kind of months, they want to see results. And if you're recomping, it may not be years until you really see true results flowing through. Whereas when you're purposely going through dedicated periods of massing, periods of cutting, results show much more quickly because it's more efficient. So I don't like I, I think Brett may have said, and I don't want to misquote him, but I feel like he said something like it's as efficient and as effective, like uh, surpluses aren't shown to be any more effective for building muscle than not being in a surplus. My argumentation would be, I'm not sure that's correct. And there is not sufficient literature to even make comments like that. But from my personal anecdote with myself, from other people I've coached, going through kind of dedicated recomposition periods where you're just aiming to maintain has not led to anything much. And I've seen so much better results when people are going through dedicated periods of really pushing up weight, pushing up food, um, their performance is much higher. They're much more bought into the process. They give it more. Um, rather than going through these recomposition periods. And I wonder if, and I commented to uh, Pascal about this, where Brett's audience are more so females who don't necessarily need big recomposition, like they don't need big muscle growth targets. Um, they're bikini. They don't want to like put on lots of weight. They maybe want to compete year to year. And so that might be his kind of maybe bias or maybe it's biased because of his population that he works with. Just like for me, it might be biased. I still think though, bikini athletes, if they have like, big um, weaknesses in terms of their glutes or their lats and they need to kind of build out these areas, they would more, see more dependable, more true results if they were to go through dedicated periods of massing and cutting and just not let it get out of control um, rather than just seeking to recomp. And I'd hate to see someone put in, and I've done it myself, I've seen other people do it, where they train super duper hard, they try and make everything as optimal in their lifestyle as possible and they just maintain and they really don't see much body composition change. And that's like gutting. If you've done that for a year because you know it's slow, but you're committed to that process and you really don't see any changes. Um, so I just feel like being in a surplus is more dependable. It's more efficient. Uh, it's probably more optimal than kind of going through just a period of maintenance. I probably missed out a bunch of stuff, but Pascal, you can fill the holes. <laughs> Yeah, I have so many thoughts on that one. <laughs> so first and foremost, let me say that, um, let me touch on the last thing you said there. And that is, it's really also hard to track the progress because already just gaining muscle mass is 
kind of trusting the process along the way because visual changes when you're gaming won't really happen that drastically. All you are visually seeing is most of the time just water retention and, and accumulated fat mass along the way. At first, the next time when you're cutting down, you will reveal and see whether something has worked or not. Um, yes, we have some indicators such as performance in the gym, but we also know that this isn't the sole indicator of whether you are putting on muscle mass or not. And let's just then say you are trusting the process of body recomp. Um, because it's so slow, you will first probably see in one or two years whether it's worked or not. And then you can't really make the adjustments on an acute basis to then go even further. Do you want to spend another year or two to actually make that happen? I don't know. Um, uh, it, it seems so... Um, unproductive for me and so unpredictable as well it can work I have used it with a couple of clients and I've seen tremendous results as well but this was more so because they were coming from a background where they had no structure in either the training the nutrition or both of them and when you're taking care of something like that like seriously taking care and it's not just like okay you believe that everything is in check and then you start something properly but it was really before that you, you just winged it um, then something like this can happen if you're genetically predisposed to it or if you are really cleaning things up and you found the magic ingredient for that person so I had a couple of people um, one is even i think in my instagram feed with um oscar like one year tremendous body recomp and second of all i think it is you really have to take the psychology of an individual into consideration as well some people it's just too hard on them to go through cyclical gaining and cutting phases they are simply not made for it when they are gaining they are too loose so not really tracking accurately the macros they are just winging things again not really structured not really pushing themselves hard eating just goes out the window and then they accumulate un unnecessary fat not really gaining that much muscle mass and then they are entering a cutting phase again too aggressive losing muscle mass along the way etc etc right for those individuals or they are even ending up binging and stuff like that for some individuals like these um a body recomp might be the way to go Next thing I just want to bring up is once again the population Brad Contreras is mostly working with and that is female competitors or bikini athletes or even just regular gym goers, um, mostly thus females who want to look better. Um, I'm not generalizing or i'm generalizing now so um if we have any kind of female listeners figure or bikinis i'm not saying that that this is you but many many female competitors or just like recreational lifters are coming from a background of body dysmorphia um had a or still have a bad relationship with food or were training really poorly like like this Instagram fit chick kind of style. And when you are then starting to be coached by Brad, who's throwing 50 sets of glute work at you, right, giving you some kind of decent programming and you're consistently following that along with a good, decent nutritional protocol, of course you are seeing a massive body recomposition because what you've done before wasn't really um, a training protocol. So basically you are a new beginner. All right. So, uh, and other than that, when it then comes to, um, let's just say, when you bring that counter argument that there's a female competitor who has gone through something like that, hey, that may very well be the case. It doesn't outrule that for her, it wasn't the case that she didn't really train appropriately or um, had her nutrition check. It could very well be the case for her as well that something of those were really not optimized uh, with Brett. He just optimized these things, made it consistent as well um, and not doing like, oh, I need to diet again, like after eight weeks of gaining or so. And he just was the reason that there was structure in it. And when it then comes to really um, competitive athletes who are truly competitive, who are maybe even winning national shows and stuff like that, um, especially like female bikini athletes, uh, some can actually, when they're really well developed, they don't 
need to actually go into a gaining phase or into a cutting phase because they are not so crazy lean that they have to gain significant amount uh, above stage weight to then feel healthy again so yeah when when they are gaining a couple of pounds perfect why not some people can actually maintain that i mean take a look at steve he is predisposed to actually or he is someone who can stay fairly lean he proved that in his last improvement season that he could actually yeah, maintain a really low body fat percentage some people are just made for that and that's the same when it comes to female athletes um, and in that case yeah then stay in that range and just recom so that you're having an easier time to then get ready for the next show right so um sorry for the long long answer but i think that there are so many cases that you could bring up that speak for that but also truly against that and in my personal opinion just to sum it up i think it's um rarely the case that i would um recommend doing a recomp um but more so going for cyclical phases but when it turns out that it's more so the appropriate way to go then i think it's absolutely feasible but i don't think that it's the superior way Cool. No, I think that was really well put. And I think the overwhelming um, and the point you made really clear and well is that it's his population that he works with, which are kind of people who aren't necessarily looking to maximize muscle growth. And my view is, and I just put this very simply, there's barely any literature on it. So we very much have to support it by anecdote and what we see out there in the world. Bodybuilders for years and years and years have been going through mass massing and cutting phases and they still do and the best ones still do that. There's a reason behind that. They're the biggest, leanest individuals out there. If you want to be the biggest and leanest, it's probably the most effective approach if everyone who is the best of the best is doing this. I don't think there's any bodybuilder who's a pro now who's just said, oh yeah, I just maintained and I got to 200 pounds shredded on stage. <laughs> like, fuck, no, you did not. <laughs> I just can't see yeah, that ever being I, I th the case. Yeah, no, it sounds bro-ish, but there, there, I think it's a really valid point to bring up, especially when you're also listening to, to, you don't have to listen to us, but just listen to people who put themselves out there as well. Someone like Alberto Nunez, for example, or Mike Isfortel, who we have on like regularly on the podcast. They all have been doing this for years now, um, even decades sometimes right and everyone is just like okay i tried it but it simply didn't work out and uh, whenever i committed to actually truly gain and have a structured gaining phase where i also sometimes allowed myself to gain a little bit more than i'm comfortable with i've seen the best performance increase and and and, and progress and i think that is more of a common thing than people who are saying like oh yeah. i had an amazing recomposition going on and it's good you brought up both of those because, uh, and I don't know if you, you probably did it on purpose actually, but both of them have come on the podcast and said, like, Berto in his last off-season said he barely made any gains because he maintained yeah. just a really lean physique. And Mike said he purposely did an experiment. I can't remember how many months he did it for, but he took a DEXA on the same DEXA and, like, many months later, after he maintained within, like, a pound the same body weight, and he was ex his body composition was exactly the same. And I remember, vividly remember him saying that experience because he was like, ever since then, he's like, I'm never fucking doing that in my life again. It was like, he wasted yeah. like three months. <laughs> hey, mate, and we always have to consider that the amount of muscle mass someone like a female competitor needs to have on her frame is quite different to a competitive male bodybuilder and we are not talking about figure or so because that's a different beast in and for itself and i don't think that they are going through recomping phases either so most of the the population brad Contreras mostly works with i mean and that's no offense against brad because he's doing a fantastic job oh, yeah. and a really great service to the industry and stuff like that but many people are following him because he's having like mostly female competitors but also he's doing a lot of yeah glued work and um presenting himself for females who would really like to have somewhat of that fitness body right um and Putting on a little bit more of muscle mass, the body doesn't fight that. Once you get started with serious weight training and serious nutrition also, or tracking that, taking care of that, and the body undergoes a change. That's not debatable, but only up to a certain point. 
Once the body gets to a point where it really gets hard to put on muscle mass, simply due to homeostasis, and that is a bi biological thing, um, the, the body doesn't want to change and it's getting harder and harder and you can actually talk with all of the bodybuilders we just mentioned there as well and all of the top guys out there at some point um, you really have to super super hard fight for um, gaining just a pound or a kilogram of muscle mass in a single year and this doesn't come just from recomping so uh, there once again you have to take that into consideration as well the targeted audience and uh, most of the time female athletes they don't need to have crazy amounts of muscle mass and the amount of muscle mass is probably still achievable for some people uh, with recomps for some people they have to go already through uh, gaining and, and cutting phases because it's out of their genetic realm to do it via recomping perfect and we're on an, for an hour Done. Um, do we have anything to plug? I don't think we do, do we? The library. Yeah, we have our for the library, always the library always on our, our website. Our um, and also, yeah, once again, you brought it up already. The new format is out called uh, Ask the Athlete. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just okay. Um. Oh, okay, it was just uh, it's it. It seems like you wanted to no. interrupt me there and say something. Um, no, ask the athlete. So we are starting every single month. There will be a, an episode, but we are starting, and we want your feedback of whether you enjoy it or not. So this is kind of the pilot, um, the the pilot episode for you guys that is now coming out. Please check it out. Give us your honest feedback because we make it dependent on, on you guys whether we will continue with that format or not. Cool. Yeah. We'd love your feedback, guys. Um, and I guess anyone who's coming to the Ultimate Coaching Seminar, we will see you fairly soon. It's actually oh, yeah. super soon now. Super soon. Super duper. Yeah. On Saturday, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah. Cheerio. Auf Wiedersehen. 